there's different places to start for Dia de los Muertos. Uh, you could start from the very personal or from the very intellectual. I prefer to look at it from the very personal. Uh, my father introduced me to uh, his type of Dia de los Muertos. My father's from central Mexico. Uh, it's important to state that because you could have some Mexicans who know about Dia de los Muertos, but they're, they're surprised by the way it's celebrated. Central Mexico tends to have the celebration of the decoration of the cemetery, of tombs in the cemetery, as well as what is called an ofrenda or a home altar. If you, will, if you think of Mesoamerica or ancient Mexico where civilizations arose, that is south of Jalisco and all the way to Central America, you had great cities. There's where you would see a, a more, I would say, involved, uh, a more elaborate celebration of the Day of the Dead than you would in northern Mexico. Uh, I would say that Dia de los Muertos offers an alternative to the human condition. How do you deal with the fact that you're going to die anyway? I believe that life is full of, of stresses and tension and different cultures can give us these crutches. Well, if you lived, if you were told you had a year to live, you'd probably try to cram uh, the rest of your life in that year. So to me, uh, some people may say, oh, the Mexicans have a macabre attitude toward death. I would say more of a practical one. Because if I know I'm going to die, I don't have time to waste on stupidity and frivolity, on hatred, you know, on racism, and on these things that, that, that limit life. Sometimes when I try to prove a point about uh, Dia de los Muertos or cultural mixture, I use myself. I'm a mestizo, that is, um, I have, um, origins from Europe and from the, um, from the indigenous people of Mexico. And you can see that um, very clearly when you look at me or look at my arm. You look at the hair here, that's a, that's a European manifestation uh, and the color is indigenous. You have a fusion of what is Spanish and, uh, and a Native American, uh, which is quite different. That does not happen in the history of the United States. Uh, the Spaniards come in, into uh, Mexico, into ancient Mexico, already with a history of, of, of racial miscegenation. Uh, they encounter um, large pools, uh, large populations, and of course racial mixture starts to take place. The same thing happens with culture. So what you have as a result today is kind of a, a mestizaje, or a mixture of pre-Columbian thought and Spanish thought. To understand the, the Catrina, you have to go back into art history and cultural history. Uh, in medieval thought, in medieval art, you have the, um, the appearance of the animated skeleton, uh, or it's called dance macabre. In Mesoamerica, or in ancient Mexico, um, the skull or, or the skeleton was, is also seen in art. Uh, there's even a, a god of death called uh, Mitlantecuchli. Uh, and his consort or his counterpart, his wife, uh, Mitlan Siwatl. And if you look at them, they're rendered as animated skeletons. But what, what you find is um, a different type of um, outlook or uh, reflection in that the skeleton or skull is not meant to scare, uh, but meant to entertain. The idea of, uh, the, the, the idea, or I would say the the symbol of, 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 of the skeleton uh, starts to really uh, take root in Mexican mainstream art uh, around the turn of the 19th century. Jose Guadalupe Posada in Mexico started using type of dance macabre uh, in his art uh, to make um, political statements. Diego Rivera um, admits that he owes much to um, Posada uh, in a very famous mural that he painted in Mexico City. Uh, it's quite an extensive one, but there's a part where he paints himself, where he depicts himself as a little child, holding hands with uh, a female, a skeleton, uh, a nicely dressed one in the style of the 1890s. And, and the skeleton is also holding hands with Posada. Uh, the skeleton is known as La Catrina. Now, Catrin in Mexican Spanish means a dandy, somebody who's well-dressed. And she's La Catrina, she's also well-dressed. Well, it seems that this now becomes popular 
um, in, in Mexican art and particularly Mexican folk art, a, a manifestation um, of, of this nature started to really take root perhaps around the middle of the 20th century. I remember about 30 years ago or 40 years ago going to Mexico City and seeing as part of Dia de los Muertos almost like a project runway where um, people would compete for the best uh, Katrina. So you would have uh, females uh, dressed up in that style, paint their faces um, uh, like a skull. There seems to be more focus now on the Katrina uh, in uh, Southern California, so that in Dia de los Muertos, you'll find um, uh, many face painters uh, be, are very uh, busy during that time um, painting uh, skulls on, on people's faces. Well, Dia de los Muertos for me is um, an act of, or acts of art and love. Art in the sense that you see, uh, you see all these paintings, you, you see the ofrenda, uh, you see the, the culinary edible art in Pan de Muertos. And, and then on the other side, it, you see the, 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 the time and, and the care that people take to set up an altar. Uh, they do it very meticulously, they take their time. Uh, I, I, when I do Dia de los Muertos, it's almost very cathartic. I'm remembering my folks, I'm smiling, I'm remembering. So, it, so I'm doing something to honor them because I love them. At the same time, the, 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 the plastic manifestation is there in the forms of, 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 like I said, the ofrenda itself.